I have the pleasure now of introducing Helen Marshall, who is a PharmD. She's a clinical pharmacist at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and the University of Washington Medical Center. She's a clinical assistant professor in the University of Washington, uh, University of Washington Pharmacy. Dr. Marshall is a clinical specialist in the Bezos Family Immunotherapy Clinic and in the hematis Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplant Clinic. She was previously a specialist in thoracic head and neck oncology, and she previously cared for patients in the SCCA with pain and management and anticoagulation clinics via collaborative practice. Dr. Marshall earned her doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of Washington of Pharmacy in Seattle, Washington. She completed a postgraduate year in pharmacy practice residency at the University of North Carolina Hospitals in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and a postgraduate degree specialty at Duke in Durham, North Carolina. She is board certified pharmac oh, I hate this, it's so hard to say it, pharmacotherapy. <laughs> that PhD thing is just a joke, I can't say these big words. <laughs> um, she's a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist and a board certified oncology pharmacist. Dr. Marshall is an active member of the Hematology Oncology Pharmacy Association, the American Society of Healthcare Systems Pharmacists, and the American College of Clinical Pharmacy and Washington State Pharmacy Association. Please join me in welcoming Helen. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, everybody can hear me? Okay, you have time to run or get out in Seattle traffic, because seriously, we're gonna do about a 180 uh, from what Jim was talking about, and you may wanna get your phone out. Um, basically, I was just told to talk about the drugs, so that is what we're going to blaze through uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, and hopefully, um, definitely some points uh, we'll reiterate from earlier today. Uh, so objectives, we'll talk about CAR T cells as a living drug. Uh, the two points in blue are taken from the overall program, but obviously fit very well into the pharmacy realm. Um, and the last thing I'll do is talk about my role in clinic. I know it's a hot topic on pharmacy listservs or trying to establish clinics. Uh, do you need a dedicated pharmacist? And obviously, uh, for the sake of my own job, I would argue uh, yes. <laughs> I, I have colleagues also that serve in our inpatient environment, taking care of patients with all of these really challenging and scary side effects as well. So uh, we work as a team. Also, one caveat going forward with these slides, it's kind of a combination of our evolving practice at SCCA and what is out there and published in the literature. So just take what I say with a grain of salt, and I think you've already heard today that different centers, just like the evolution of transplant, are doing uh, things differently, and that comes through definitely with side effect management um, and all of the agents we'll talk about. Uh, so how are our new CAR T cells different from our traditional therapeutic <laughs> drugs? Uh, well, many ways, right? Uh, you've probably heard about uh, things like CAR T cells, tumor uh, infiltrating lymphocytes or TIL cells today, um, vaccines, those are all of those things that are fitting into that living drug category that is being used in the lay press. As a juxtaposition, um, when we're talking about traditional therapeutics, they're usually derived from small molecules. I'll save you from putting up a chemical structure um, or our you know, newer, Newer things like monoclonal antibodies, but in comparison, uh, those are still uh, relatively small molecules. Um, all of those facilities out there and all drugs that are made have to undergo um, standard good manufacturing practice, and this is to ensure safety, purity, potency, and that's completely different uh, from these living drug products who, yes, they go through quality control in the lab or with the, the pharmaceutical manufacturer, but really the technology just just isn't there compared uh, to the old standards. Um, so you've seen this already, um, but I'm a pharmacist, I can't talk, not talk about how a drug works. Um, so across the top, your key components of a CAR T cell, 
uh, your T cell activation domain, uh, one or more co-stimulatory domains, your hinge and transmembrane regions, and then an antigen recognition moiety that's usually derived from an antibody. And that's what allows us to target a specific type of cell. So we're talking about CD19 for our FDA-approved products, but you've heard about today other potential targets that are being studied in clinical trials. BCMA, SLAMF7 for multiple myeloma, uh, CD20, we have monoclonal antibodies that target CD20 specifically, um, and probably will have CAR T cells in the future. Here's another depiction, and you've seen this from Dr. Maloney already. Uh, the second generation is really where the action is at, using one or more, uh, one co-stimulatory domain, uh, primarily either CD28 or 41BB, which are also present on uh, the surface of T cells. So tisagen leucel uh, was our first CAR T cell therapy. It was approved last August for its first indication. Uh, in ALL, in patients up to 25 years of age. Um, then it's got its second indication just recently, back in May, so only a month and a half ago, uh, in lymphomas. And the cell doses are listed for you there, and I won't go into that piece. It's been uh, discussed earlier today. Um, this is potentially what your product looks like when it comes back from the manufacturer. So, uh, really blurring the line in between cellular product and drug. Um, FDA is regulating these um, up at the top. I don't know where the pointer is on this fancy thing, but you'll see the NDC. That stands for National Drug Code. Every drug out there has one of those numbers. Um, and then you're looking at key things on the label, including the patient's name, uh, date of birth, and those kind of patient identifiers. Big controversy out there in the pharmacy community really was what are you gonna do with labeling the product? This is a drug, does it go through your pharmacy? Does it not go through your pharmacy? Different institutions are handling that differently. Um, we have elected to run ours through cellular therapy uh, and not have any pharmacy involvement at all, but there are centers out there where pharmacy is going to the patient's bedside and attaching an additional label. Axicaptogene Silolucel uh, was our second FDA-approved product back in October of last year, uh, also uh, first indicated for uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. The key difference in indication in terms of lymphoma between the products is that uh, AxiCell is labeled for primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. Uh, and this is what some of the labeling looks like for AxiCell, again, an NDC code, patient identifiers, uh, et cetera. So I'm sure you've talked extensively about uh, this process as well earlier today, and I'm sorry I could just join for the afternoon session. Um, but the flow and how uh, these living drugs are made, obviously the patient's own cells are collected via apheresis. Um, they're sent off to the company that further manufactures, potentially separating out your CD4 and CD8 cells, and then you're essentially making genetic modifications. So different ways this is done at different centers. Uh, for example, Penn and at the Hutch, we use a lentivirus uh, to make these genetic modifications, uh, whereas MD Anderson uses a, what's called a Sleeping Beauty transposon. Uh, Sloan uses a retrovirus type system. Um, so basically, we're changing the product uh, and then growing it back up, expanding the cells. They're going through quality control and checks and ultimately sent back to the center. The piece that's really missing from this nice diagram is that before the cells are reinfused to the patient, they undergo that lymphodepletion chemotherapy. Points we've talked about uh, earlier as well. So in terms of AxiCell in their pivotal trial, Zuma-1, the median time from cell collection to a facility receiving the cells was 17 days. Now earlier, Dr. Maloney said that was fast, but it can take longer, um, and our patients are sick, often having active disease and active symptoms in that time. Uh, so you have to address the question of are you going to do something to hold them after their cells are collected uh, before they get reinfused because they may be sick. 
So in Zuma 1, they didn't allow for any kind of treatment in that window. So they had to enroll pretty good looking patients that weren't actively progressing. But in uh, the Tisogen loop blue cell study for lymphoma, on the other hand, 90%, that number was quoted earlier again, of those patients received some kind of bridging therapy. Uh, so how do you decide what you're gonna do that's really based on your patient? Um, what treatments have they gotten before? Has anything worked? Um, what can they tolerate? Uh, what's the status of their organ function? Um, things that we've used, uh, multi-agent chemotherapy regimens, sometimes requiring hospital admission, so something like salvage rice for lymphoma in a patient that hadn't gotten it. Um, sometimes we use steroids. We're far enough away from that treatment that we consider that to be safe. Sometimes we use some of the novel oral uh, agents for these patients. So always an individual decision. Uh, if they're on a commercial product, you really don't have any guidelines, but if they're on a protocol, often there is a specific washout period and you have to time that all very carefully with when you think you're going to be able to get them uh, started on lymphodepletion and when they're going to get their cells. Uh, so lymphodepletion, you've also heard this word a lot. Uh, the goals, tumor debulking, uh, so treating the disease, but then enhancing the potency of the CAR T cells. And I like to th think kind of in simple terms. My parents are teachers. I married a teacher. You can think what you will. Um, but you're really making room for those T cells to set up shop and start working. Um, we don't know the optimal lymphodepletion regimen to date. Um, and, but we've talked about uh, some importance of adding on fludarabine. That was data that came out of our institution comparing the addition of fludarabine to cyclophosphamide alone, showing an improved uh, CAR T cell persistence and an improved disease-free survival. If you go back and look at all of the patients that have been treated with CAR T cells to date, sometimes we're using high-dose cyclophosphamide, etoposide's been used, bendamustine's been used, so lots of agents out there have been used. Uh, the two approved products, though, and where we're going in most of our clinical trials are a combination of low-dose fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. Um, so lots of words on a lot of my slides, but I just really want it there as a reference for you. Uh, key things to note, even though it's all low-dose cyflu, the doses, the days, and the amounts of the drug are different, not only with product, but even within the disease state that you're treating. So it's really important to go back to the prescribing information or the protocol that you're using and make sure that you are using the correct regimen. So cyclophosphamide and fludarabine, oldie but goodie chemotherapy drugs, right? So as a reminder, Psy is a cell cycle non-specific nitrogen mustard. It works by uh, preventing DNA from becoming cross-linked. It does have to be activated in the liver uh, to its active metabolites. Typical adverse effects include myelosuppression, nausea and vomiting, uh, and hair loss. Uh, and then really as you get into those high doses, then you're really concerned about the potential for nausea and vomiting, the potential for hemorrhagic cystitis, cardiac toxicity, um, and additional side effects. So when you're thinking SOS and BOD, you're really thinking about your transplant population uh, in regimens with high dose cyclophosphamide in combination with either uh, total body irradiation or busulfan. Fludarabine, on the other hand, is a cell cycle specific purine analog uh, that inhibits both DNA polymerase and ribonucleotide reductase, okay? It also has to be uh, changed into its active form by undergoing a dephosphorylation. The side effects that are bolded on this slide are all of the black box warnings of fludarabine, so that includes myelosuppression, the potential for autoimmune effects, and neurotoxicity, which I'll come back to in just a moment. Um, but really, you can see the importance of the fludarabine kind of by its mechanism is that it's pretty good at taking out both CD4 and CD8 cells, potentially for a long period of time, and it can take patients uh, a long time to recover those counts, and that's one of the reasons that it's important in that lymphodepletion regimen. Uh, other side effects are listed for you there. 
So there was some concern with the use of fludarabine for lymphodepletion. Um, there have been deaths attributed to neurotoxicity, of course, one of our black box warnings for these agents. Um, in Juno's rocket trial, specifically looking at the JCAR-15 construct, uh, five patients died and they stopped uh, investigation of this particular car. Um, and Zuma-1, one, uh, one patient died of neurotoxicity. Um, and really that was linked to cerebral edema. So um, as we had started to add fludarabine into these regimens, there was a lot of concern that fludarabine was a contributor as uh, neuro neurotoxicity was a known potential rare side effect. Um, but really over time, uh, we don't think that fludarabine is a contributor. So this cerebral edema really appears to be linked to our CAR T cells. Um, it may be associated with that rapid expansion of CAR T cells, whereas fludarabine-based neurotoxicity, it's not really, cerebral edema isn't linked. There are other uh, neurotoxic uh, side effects. Uh, so we are proceeding with the use of fludarabine. I think you've talked a lot about uh, REMS. So again, this goes back to treating something that's really a patient's own cell, uh, like a drug. FDA has mandated a REMS program. So there are other REMS programs out there. There's a REMS program for opioids, uh, for the short-acting fentanyl products. You have to go through, take a quiz, become a certified provider. Immunomodulatory agents. Uh, bane of my existence, their program is so hard to navigate. Uh, all going back to giving thalidomide uh, as an anti-nausea drug to pregnant women a long time ago, and now we have to jump through a lot of hoops and do a lot of surveys, take a lot of time just to prescribe a month's worth of drug. Uh, so this is the setup for CAR T cells, again, uh, primarily based on our serious adverse effects. Um, I think you've probably been through this, but the hospital has to be certified. You have to have an authorized representative. Ours is Carrie Stricker. You'll hear from her tomorrow. Um, in charge of maintaining all the policies and procedures and establishing uh, those education programs. Uh, you have to have two doses of tocilizumab available on site uh, for immediate administration, which is defined as two hours. That's really uh, a huge role for pharmacy operations to step into to ensure that that can happen. Everybody has to be educated about the signs, symptoms, grading, and management of both CRS and neurotoxicity. And part of their program is the patients receive a wallet card, which reminds them of the signs and symptoms, has the treating oncologist's name on it, um, and patients have to remain within two hours of a treating hospital or clinic. At SCCA, we keep ours uh, within 30 minutes, ideally. Um, the card is meant, you know, for example, if the patient is found down from neurotoxicity out in the field, hopefully that gets found in their wallet and then the treating uh, ED is aware that they're a CAR T cell patient. So these black box warnings we've talked about, I, I won't go into all the details, but CRS and then neurologic toxicity, it's also known as CRESS or CAR T associated, associated encephalopathy syndrome. Um, CRS can affect essentially any organ system, uh, really think cardiac toxicity, hypotension, renal dysfunction, liver toxicity, um, you name it, that system can be affected. Uh, the neurotoxicity, lots of different signs and symptoms, you've heard about headache, but anxiety, things that are common or could be occurring if you're just in the hospital, uh, you could get a little delirious. Uh, but it leads all the way up to encephalopathy and, and cerebral edema and death. Um, so the handwriting example up there is interesting. Um, that's days four, five, and six after CAR T cells. Um, they give you a mini mental status score. One of the tools used, maybe not the ideal tool for evaluating neurotoxicity. We've heard what Sloan Kettering is doing. Someone mentioned CARTOX10. That's a recommendation out of MD Anderson as a way to evaluate these neurologic toxicities. But there was only a two-point drop in the many mental um, on day five when you clearly see that the patient has no capacity uh, for handwriting and can't, can't write a complete sentence, and then that's changed the subsequent day, and their many mental score is, is back up to where it was two days ago. Um, in terms of the trials out there and what's reported, especially in terms of CRS and neurotoxicity, Alani is the pivotal trial for uh, the pediatric ALLs, Juliet for the lymphomas, again, without full data published at this point. 
um, and Zuma 1 for AxiCell. Again, just highlighting the point that the toxicity rates are different between the different products. Um, one of the other big warnings is this potential for prolonged cytopenias. Um, it's reported differently with Tisogen Leucil, which is uh, the, some of the numbers aren't up there, but uh, with Zuma, again, some of the most common toxicities are myelosuppression. So what do we do, um, especially in terms of neurotoxicity and cytokine release syndrome? Uh, we do have tocilizumab approved on the same day as Tisogen Leucil for the treatment of cytokine release syndrome. Um, this blocks interleukin-6, which is one of those cytokines that gets revved up in that cytokine storm. It blocks the receptor specifically, uh, both to soluble receptors and those that are membrane-bound, um, indicated in pediatric patients as well, so uh, two years and older. Um, it does not cross the blood-brain barrier, indicating probably not that effective in terms of neurotoxicity. This drug was originally approved for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, so that means patients are receiving it on a chronic daily basis. So some of those side effects, um, some myelosuppression, changes in cholesterol, changes in liver function, but really with CRS and neurotoxicity, we're giving a limited number of doses, usually up to a max of four, so we're less worried about kind of the long-term side effects. Um, you saw data earlier, if it is given, uh, it often resolves fever and hypotension very quickly. So my next set of about four slides, uh, I don't want to read through them all. They're from the package labeling for each product. Uh, but again, I will reiterate to you that there are differences in the trials, there are differences in the grading skills that are used for CRS, and there are differences in how each product recommends these be used. And then I will tell you that we derived a completely different practice at SCCA before these products were even approved as to how we were treating this based on what grade. There are five different grading scales out there as far as I can tell for CRS. Um, so it gets complicated. Uh, the group from MD Anderson tried to put together some consensus guidelines, but then they still updated the CRS scale that was most often used, published back in 2014. So, um, you just really have to get into the weeds um, and look at, at what you're treating. But I wanted the information here uh, for you for a reference for what's in the labeling. So again, different recommendations between products. There are also different recommendations about when to give the steroids um, and what to give. So steroids, the magic drug, um, what do they do? They work in a lot of different ways and, and we don't even really understand it all to date. Um, but we know they decrease inflammation, reverse uh, capillary permeability, and suppress that normal immune response, which of course is the opposite of what we want to happen with our CAR T cells. Really steroids are first line for neurotoxicity. Uh, the ones most commonly used are methylprednisolone and dexamethasone. And again, uh, the subsequent slides represent differences in how you should utilize those products. Lots of controversy out there. Why steroids are considered second line by a lot of institutions for CRS is we are fearful to give them and diminish our effect of CAR T cells. So this uh, graph nicely depicts that. Uh, the green arrow is uh, the administration of tocilizumab. This is a patient that had ALL. Uh, the red, uh, you can see we started uh, steroids with dexamethasone. That pink line uh, is the representation of a patient's fever um, and then the black dotted line is their CAR T cells. And you can see when we start giving uh, steroids, potentially that CAR T cell drops off. So that is, continues to be a, a real theoretical concern. Um, but again, Dr. Maloney said, you know, the good comes with the bad um, and you have to be wary about treating these potentially fatal side effects. Uh, there are other potential agents that we can use for CRS. There is very little data to do this. So there is almost nothing published in the literature. This is um, good mechanistic thought as to why these should work. Uh, so siltuximab also binds to IL-6, but it binds IL-6 itself instead of the receptor. Um, so in theory, when you give tocilizumab and block up all the receptors, uh, your IL-6 continues to increase. There's fear that that crosses the blood-brain barrier and increases the risk of neurotoxicity for the patient. 
So with Sotuximab, you're theoretically taking out that option because you're binding IL-6 directly itself. Um, we've used it only in a few patients uh, at our center, but there are recommendations out there to use it. But again, I will go back to there is very little data. I think we'll learn more about the management of this in the future. Um, I read some interesting mouse data for management of CRS uh, with IL-1, uh, so uh, that looked good in mice, but of course we're a long way from doing that uh, in humans. All right, very little time to talk about all of the other drugs. HLH and MAS, another big concern with these agents. TOSI and steroids are your drugs of choice. Um, there is a paper out there that suggests using etoposide in refractory cases or intrathecal cytarabine uh, for neurotoxicity. To my knowledge, that has not been done in CAR T cell patients. These are other hereditary uh, disorders where HLH has developed, um, but that information is out there. In terms of neurotoxicity and seizure uh, prophylaxis and treatment, uh, for prophylaxis, not recommended standardly for all patients yet, but those for higher tumor burden, uh, ALL, or if they've had any CNS involvement in their disease, it should be considered. And if patients actually develop a seizure, either increase that dose of levetiracetam, um, stop the status with drugs like lorazepam. Patients that are uh, sicker in the ICU may be experiencing intracranial pressure increases. Hopefully you have neurology on board by that point, but you can consider acetazolamide if they're on a vent or continuing on high-dose steroids for a long period of time, stress ulcer prophylaxis. Uh, if they're inpatient and not moving, but you have to judge your plate, platelet count and, and thrombocytopenia, uh, but you may consider DBT prophylaxis. For hypotension, fluids are your first line. Don't forget to discontinue a patient's home. Uh, antihypertensives, many of them uh, come in on those agents in clinic, and when they leave and we send them home, hopefully a month later, uh, they may not be on them anymore. Uh, so they may need to be followed in the future and, and restarted. Um, if your fluid boluses aren't working, then you move to vasopressors. It's been a long time since I practiced in the ICU. In fact, I blocked that part of my training out. Um, this is here only for your knowledge. Part of the grading of CRS is that um, if they're on, quote, high-dose vasopressors, and those are the doses listed here, multiple vasopressors, have to be on them for at least three hours. So that's defined to help you uh, know how to grade that CRS. Uh, comes in as to when to use your TOSI and your steroids. We are learning more and more about patients' infection risks. So both of the studies here, um, one is from Sloan, one is from here, are recent publications going back and looking at some of these patients. So you can see kind of in that early first 30-day period, um, a range of 23 to 43 uh, percent of folks experiencing some type of early infection, can be bacterial uh, or fungal, um, some developing life-threatening infections, which seems to be associated with grade three, so really severe CRS so far. Um, also, potentially patients at risk, if they have ALL, if they've had a lot of pretreatment or received higher doses of CAR T cells. And then kind of in that later course, 30 days out to 100, um, they are reporting lots of different respiratory type of viruses. Febrile neutropenia. Uh, just a quick word. We're giving lymphodepleting chemo. They may be neutropenic from their disease anyways, and then we may have these prolonged cytopenias. So a lot of patients are neutropenic. Their first sign of CRS is probably gonna be a fever and their counts are gonna be low. So do they really have an infection? No idea. They need to be worked up and they need to be put on broad spectrum antibiotics. So if your institution has a carbapenem as your first line uh, for febrile neutropenia, that might not be the greatest for these patients as drugs like imipenem can potentially lower the seizure threshold. Just something to keep in mind. Uh, if patients are having a fever, cooling blankets, acetaminophen, you want to try to avoid uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Those actually can interfere with um, some of the markers of T-cell activation, like tumor necrosis uh, factor alpha. 
And then how do we prophylax people? Again, really across the board of what different centers do. Um, lots of protocols say per institutional standard, what we do uh, here is largely derived from uh, how we prophylax our autologous stem cell transplant patients. Um, so we are using levofloxacin as our fluoroquinolone uh, when ANC drops below 500. Uh, for PCP prophylaxis, different centers starting at different times, usually uh, we start when we're close to sending them home. Uh, Bactrim drug of choice, but if their counts haven't recovered or they have bad renal function, you may look to Dapsone. Um, and then continuing for a recommended time frame unknown, three to six months is kind of what we're saying. MD Anderson, I know, continues until their CD4 count is uh, greater than 200 again. Uh, same for antiviral drugs. We use acyclovir or valacyclovir, continuing that three to six months. They're on that throughout treatment. Um, antifungal prophylaxis, if you really expect them to be neutropenic for a long period of time, that's a good consideration, and they have a past history of infection. Um, we are not currently routinely doing that for everyone in clinic. Uh, the B cell aplasia, so your CAR T cells have worked, and they have also worked on your patient's healthy B cells. So um, the recommendation is to monitor um, and replace with IVIG when IgD levels are lower than 400. In the transplant world, Choosing Wisely has just come out with that you shouldn't be using IVIG unless patients have chronic infections. Um, I think everybody in CAR-T world just jumped to that standing practice in transplant, so this one may evolve over time. Um, and then we talked about hematologic toxicity kind of throughout this portion. Transfusion support, growth factor is very controversial here. Uh, lots of different centers doing lots of different things starting at different points in time, day minus one, day two. Tisogen glucils labeling specifically says to avoid GMCSF for the first three weeks after infusion. Uh, the concern theoretical with growth factors is that it could make CRS worse. Uh, so look at your protocol. Um, we have not found that to be true. We do use uh, GCSF support uh, for these patients, but again, this continues to evolve. Patients could react to their CAR T cells. They're at prolonged risk of tumor lysis. Um, so allopurinol, longer than with your standard chemotherapy, we, continue, we go about three weeks out. Um, nausea and vomiting from your chemotherapy. Good idea to obviously you want to avoid the steroid component. Um, and then, though, you, avoiding drugs like lorazepam that are sedating that could uh, potentially get in, in the way of your neurologic evaluation. Eight essential steps, we saw them earlier. I was happy to see that uh, pharmacists and pharmacy were involved. I'm just gonna say at SCCA, we are also involved in steps two, three, four, and seven across uh, the board, uh, getting involved early with the care of these patients. Um, things I do in clinic, um, why you need a pharmacist, outpatient and inpatient, comprehensive medication reviews, special attention to drugs to avoid, um, following protocols, watching for washout periods, timing uh, that salvage therapy, making sure appropriate supportive care is ordered. We verify all of our chemotherapy, including lymphodepletion salvage regimens, and we actually verify the cell orders as well electronically, really is a double check that all the supportive care is there. Assistant medication access, we're involved in the tocilizumab process. We provide information for patients and our teams are involved in transitions of care and then some administrative functions as well with protocol review, electronic order sets, and trying to work towards standardizing some of our practices. So I went a little over, I'm sorry, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.